Dealing with grief and adversity has almost become the new normal during COVID-19. Perhaps we can take a leaf out of the book by Anna Marie Connolly, absorbing too much of the atmosphere when it comes to how we cope with change. Don't go away. We will be right back. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Writer's Corner live show. I'm your host, Bridgetti Lambanda from Cape Town in South Africa. The stream is made possible by StreamYard. In today's show, we talk to Anna Marie Con Connolly about her book, Absorbing Too Much of the Atmosphere. Anna Marie is, like most of us, just an ordinary person going through her daily life. She lives in a small town close to the southernmost tip of Africa, and I'm in Cape Town in South Africa, by the way, yet her life has been filled with extraordinary challenges, just like most other ordinary people. What she's done, however, is take that life and expose it to a world as she relates how ordinary people can accomplish remarkable things in dire circumstances. She deals with heartbreak and tragedy with a great sense of humor and common sense and never allows her circumstances to get her down. Her book is both revealing of a life as a wife and mother of two boys and of what the human spirit can accomplish if we never give up. And so let's not waste any more time. Let's invite Anna Marie to the show and learn more about her story. Anna Marie, hi, welcome to the Writer's Corner live show. Great to have you today. Hello, Brigetti. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me. An absolute, absolute pleasure. I'm intrigued by the by your book and the title of your book. How did you come up with that title? <laughs> Well, it was, it's not, I can't take credit for it, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> if you read the book, you will have to see what it means, because I don't want to actually give too much away, but it was something my son said, the one, my son, who is a schizophrenic, and um, I, I thought that was very apt, and it was the perfect title for the book, because everything that happened with my journey with him was actually it just made sense that just gave the perfect t title because it nothing made sense that happened with me and him and yet it made sense to use that title because that's something he said and he he said very strange things and he has said very strange things over the years so that was just one of the things <laughs> <laughs> and so a question i like to ask many people is you know we've all got a story in us a story to tell we all have a journey there's not a single person who doesn't have a story um but not everyone gets to the point where they feel that they would want to share that story with the rest of the world what is it that propelled you to want to become um an author are you an accidental author did you decide that you know you want to share the story why did you want to share your story it it came about accidentally again. I have been thinking about it over the years since my husband died. I thought once I should write a blog and I found a space on the internet and I started a blog and I started writing a few things down and then something happened and I left it. And <laughs> it was about two years later, I thought I should actually most probably add to that 
And I couldn't find the location again. I didn't know what happened to it. So I just left it. I thought, oh, no, don't worry. And then I met a gentleman and he asked me, if, he asked me about my son and his situation and condition because my son is a schizophrenic. And I was, I told him a few things and he's, he was absolutely flabbergasted. His mouth was hanging open. He said, it's unbelievable. You should write these things down. And I thought, okay, maybe I could. And I just, the very next day after I spoke to him, I started writing. And that was a year ago. And well, a bit longer than a year ago. It was in June last year. And I started writing just off the cuff. I didn't really know what to say. I just started writing. And it just started to flow. And and luckily, over the years, I've kept a few notes. Some things happened years ago. Some things happened recently in the last three or two or three or four or four years. But many of the things, I just had a few notes here and there. I had documentation in my cupboard from, from things that happened. And when I wasn't sure of a date, I just sort of looked it up and... Yes, and that's how it started. And I just started writing and it started flowing and it just all came out. <laughs> that is amazing because, you know, we all have a journey. We all write notes. Um, how did you put it together to form a book? Did you did you get some professional advice um, or did you just, you know, did you put it together by yourself? How? What was your talk a little bit about your journey? Because there's, there's so many people like yourself, you know, ordinary people with stories. We all have a journey. Um, how did you go about putting your book together? I certainly didn't have professional help. I just, it just came out off the cuff. I just wrote it. I sat down and literally I started and I thought, okay, I should most probably, if I want to write about Andrew Paul, my son, I should start when he was a child because everybody always asked me, how did you know? What was wrong? How did you notice there was something different about him? And I thought, okay, I'll start at the beginning. And I started from the time he was born. And I just, I started writing and I was just telling a story and, I, and it just sort of flowed. I didn't, I didn't get any, from, uh, any help from anybody. Um, and, and it follows, it's followed chronologically, obviously. And I started writing about when he was little and then he was growing up and then he, he got a bit older and other things happened in between and he got a brother and, and it just sort of, it, it just flew, it flowed out of me. I, I can't explain it. Um, it was very easy to write it actually. And as, as you say, everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a journey. Every single person has a journey. And, but to just to be able to say, well, yes, now I'm going to sit down and write it down. Of course, in the past, when when my husband was still alive and I had to run a business, I didn't have time to do this. I would have never been able to do it then. But in the last couple of years, things have settled down. I've I've become more quiet. I don't have all these people around me. <laughs> my son is in the home. My husband died. The family that was giving me upheaval, they they all gone, and yes, so I have time to I had time in my hands, so I could do it, and I literally just sat down and started writing it, and things just started happening. And of course, I'm a great reader. I've been reading all my life. I love reading, and I think that helps just to get things out. You know, that is amazing. So tell us a little bit about um, your son and and how your parenting was different with him? Well, in the beginning, there wasn't anything different. Um, I think when he was a little kid, he was just a little boy. He was a sweet little kid. He grew up and at some stage, somebody told us that he thought he looked like he was hyperactive. He was in the soccer team and he was looking around and minding his own, doing his own thing and then listen to the coach. And this gentleman came up to us and said, you know, your son looks like he's hyperactive because he doesn't listen to the coach. And we watched him for a few weeks and we had to admit, yes, it's true. You know, he doesn't really, he's not listening. He's, he's standing there daydreaming. And I took him to a, to a psychiatrist. He was about 10 years old at the time. And the psychiatrist, psychiatrist um, diagnosed him as having hypersent, uh, hyperactive being hyperactive, calling it ADD or ADHD, as they call it nowadays, attention deficit hyper dis disorder or something like that. 
And I put him on Ritalin, and he, I took, gave him Ritalin for a year. I didn't want him to become too, too addicted to it, actually. And and he grew up, and he, he was fine. And But I know he, he, he abused. Well, he used to smoke from an early age. I think he smoked from an early age, not that I knew when he actually started. We didn't smoke at the time, so it was quite strange. Um, and I know when he was a teenager, he, he started smoking cannabis. And he also denied it, but I knew he did it. Even though I knew nothing about drugs or recreational drugs, even cannabis, I, the signs were there. This, this, the dilated pupils, the giggles, the munchies, and all those things people used to tell me. That's what cannabis does. And then as he was in high school, he, he didn't want to go to school anymore. And I really had to plead with him to ask him, please, you know, just finish your trick. Eventually he finished matric, how? I don't know, because he never studied. But he's quite, he's, he's clever, he's very intelligent. And, um, and it was only later, when after he left school and he didn't know what to do, we couldn't get him to, to, to have a job and he didn't have a job and he was fiddling around and then he joined the gym. And okay, that went fine for a while. And then he started to study as a personal trainer. So he did that with distant learning through, um, Cape Teachers Academy, and he worked in the gym, and things were going all right. But that's the time when he started acting out. He was, he used to shout at the top of his voice, "Leave me alone, go away! I don't want to hear you, and I want to listen to you." And we didn't know what that was. When I asked him about it, he said, "Oh, the voices in his head told him to do stupid things." But still, it didn't really click. I didn't really know what that meant. Um, yes, so it was, and that's how it started really when I, we became strange and do the stupid things. And then the psychosis came and the delusions and the hallucinations and everything else. So it was a progressive, it was a progressive disease. Um, you didn't pick it up too much when he was younger. It was mainly from his teenage years onwards when it became more of a challenge in your life. Yes, definitely. As a, as a child, we I only th we thought he was a dreamer. We have dreamers in our family, people who seem to be in a different world all the time, but they got on with their lives and they get on with their lives. They've got jobs, they've got families, they, they're fine. So we just put it down to him being a dreamer. Um, but until he started acting out, especially with that, with the, with the voices, we didn't really think of much about it. Um, and even then, I didn't do anything about it. And and there was actually a serious situation where he attacked my husband and <laughs> he nearly strangled him. And if you could picture the scene, my husband is, was six foot six. He was a, an extremely large man. My son is six foot three. He's also large, but he, he pinned his dad down and... and he thought he was going strangling and and that's when i realized gosh no, i have to do something about this immediately um before he does something else to somebody else and that's when i had him admitted to hospital against his wishes of course involuntary mm -hmm. and they admitted him at um at Lentegeer, which is a, a psychiatric hospital in cape town in mitchell's plain and there they diagnosed him as having paranoid schizophrenia. Wow, that was a long journey to finding a diagnosis. And I think that is probably the difficult part with, uh, you know, when you have parenting issues is not having a diagnosis because it's very difficult to deal with what you've got if you don't know what you're dealing with um, to start off with. So how much of that do you put into your book? Essentially, the I think three quarters of the book is about him and my journey with him, because I mean that's just one tiny section of it. Um, I deal with with the things he did and does and 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 used to do before he be, be, before diagnosis, after diagnosis, when he was supposed to be on on medication, he wouldn't take his medication. He did absolutely shocking things. Well. 
shocking to me, he ran away from home. He became a hobo for a week. I didn't know where he was or what he was doing. He, he, he lived on the streets of Cape Town. Of course, I was extremely worried about him. I didn't know where he was. He he ended up in jail at some stage. So there's, there are a lot of stories that I could tell from, you know, just what he did and, and before his medication was actually stabilized, which only happened recently. Only... I mean, he was diagnosed in 2006, a month short of his 22nd birthday. And he is now 30, 35 years old and 36 years old. And only now in the last year, I can really say that he's, that he's got insight into his problem. He, he doesn't fight it anymore. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't actually seem to be so against it where he's just refuses to take medication he takes it quite willingly now what was the most challenging um part of the book for you to write about um because you know when you're writing a book and you're sharing your story it makes you vulnerable what was is there a moment in the book that you that you write about that you sort of think should i shouldn't i have included that but that bit <laughs> there are many such bits i i can't actually pinpoint one or two or three it everything seems to be over the top things that happen to me when people hear about it they say what but how why what how did you cope give what us give us one example anna marie can you give us one example um, well i also write okay one thing that Andrew Paul did, um, he used to just wander. He, he wanders around the streets, okay, so he gets into trouble. So one night, I, we didn't come home. Um, for three days, he didn't come home. I find the police. I asked them, have you seen him perhaps wandering around town? So the, I to go into the police station. I give him, give him his ID document. And the policeman says to me, Oh, but he's here. He's in the cells. We have him here. I thought, what? It was actually his birthday. It was the 5th of June, 2002 or somewhere around there. And he was in the cells because he'd been caught in town smoking cannabis or having or some in his possession. So they locked him up for two days and he wasn't allowed to phone me. So, you know, as a mother, you go, you go crazy. You don't know where he is, what he's doing, what he's up to. I know he's up to no good. And then, of course, I had to go to jail on a Monday morning, uh, to, to, to court on a Monday morning, and go and bail him out um, after I found him guilty of possession of, of, of cannabis, and I had to pay a fine and get him out. And his, his friend, his accomplice, his crony who was with him, was actually let off the hook. But he came to our house, and while I was in court, he spoke to my husband, and he said to my husband, please, you must pay the fine. You mustn't let him go to jail. Because they will send him to Caledon prison, a prison about 75 kilometers from us. And there he would be in a cell with 40 other people. He said, and Andrew Paul is not streetwise. He doesn't know how to handle himself. He's very naive, actually. And he, he, will, get, he will get killed in jail. So don't please just pay his fine and don't let him go to jail. And that was sort of... Uh, you know, an eye-opening moment, and um, of course we pay the fine. And that is one instance. There, are, I had the police at my house at least once, twice a week, where they came to go, take away people that would just gather around him. He used to pick up homeless people and bring them home, and he used they used to sleep with with him in his room and on his on the floor and steal all his stuff. It, yeah. It's everything is just incredulous, actually. <laughs> that is that is a that is a lot. Just one story, you know, <laughs> right there is a lot to deal with. Um, as a mom, you know, you almost want to pull your hair out. Um, <laughs> how how did you survive all of this and get to tell the story? I never thought about it as. At, at the time when it was happening, I didn't actually go sit down and think, now why is this happening to me? 
I could I might as well have asked why isn't it? You know, it, it, it's the luck of the draw. That's what what you have, and that's what you get. And I just dealt with it. I every day, every day I had to go to work, I had to earn a living. We had a business, I had to earn a living, and still deal with Andrew Paul, um, mostly without my husband's knowledge, because I didn't want them to get into a confrontation and a fight. Because my husband used, I don't think men have the empathy that. That women have, or mothers have, at least. You know, you didn't have time I think for that, it. I think their coping mechanism is is different, and that's why we give birth to them, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. So I had to cope, and I never questioned it. I I don't know what made me get up every day. I'm just, I suppose, I just have that kind of personality I think that you never, go through on autopilot, isn't it? You don't I don't think, as, you know, I, I think as a mom, you don't have the luxury of thinking about things. No. You are, no. you know, you are the, the CEO of the ship and you, you literally <laughs> just, you know, you, you don't get, you go, you don't get to get off the boat. At no point do you get to jump the ship. You have to steer that ship come hell or high waters. Um, and I think you don't really give consideration to the murky waters or whatever is happening out there. You just need to know that whatever happens, you have to keep this boat afloat. It, it cannot flip, you know. Yes. So I think that's it's why you kind of you know, deal you with all the little don't. detail. Yeah, no. you get up every day, you go about your business, and I know what will come today because I have to make sure Andrew Paul takes his medicine and he gets his pills and if I have to take him to the hospital or the clinic to go and fetch it. If I leave him, he will he will never end up at the clinic. He will just wander around the streets and get waylaid somewhere, and he won't get to the clinic. So I had to physically take him there, get his pills. Every day was was just a battle, but it never. I never thought of it. I never thought of why is my life like this. I didn't ever think about it. It was just it just happened. I just dealt with it every day, every single day. And did what I had to do, and I, more I can't say. I don't know how I did it. This is just how it what it how it happened. <laughs> your, your book, did you write it um, with an audience in mind? Yes, I did. I wanted when I started writing it um, because the gentleman that 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 told me to write it down. He said to me, "You should write it down because." I'm sure people would want to know about it. And I've had plenty of people over the years who ask me about Andrew Paul and what is schizophrenia. Most people don't know what it is. And I thought, okay, I can't tell my story to every single person I meet, and it's too long. I will now writing it down. They can read the book. Hopefully somebody can get some insight into this, this mental illness, which is very little is known about it, I think. Um, and also maybe get help. If they have a person who, who may be displaying the same kind of symptoms, they can know, okay, fine, we must now deal with this. Because it won't get better, it will only get worse. And I think it, it may help somebody who's dealing with the same kind of problem with a, with a son or a daughter with a mental illness. You know, on, on top of that, I didn't just have that. I then had a husband who got dementia. So I had to look after him too. He didn't. He didn't recognize me in the end. He, he didn't know I was his wife. He didn't know who I was. Did and you add I that had, into the book? Really? Yes, the story is all in there. It's all in the book. <laughs> and I had to make this whole total mind shift that I had to realize. Look, this isn't my husband any longer. He is now my patient, and I have to deal with him as my patient. And it ended up with. With, with my husband getting the same medication that my son was taking for 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 delusions and for illusion, uh, um, hallucinations, you know, and, and and psychosis because of dementia, so we come a full circle with Andrew Paul with the with the haloperidol, and then and Gavin ended up with haloperidol. So that's all in the book, and I had a further journey because he got sick, he got cancer. Um, in the meantime, my sister came to live with us. And she had a husband who had dementia. <laughs> so I had three psychiatric patients in my in my in my house at once, and I still had to work and earn a living, dealing with all these three men that were just mentally ill. 
<laughs> so we'll, we'll tell, you, you have to tell us what was your, you know, what was your formula for dealing with all of this? Because, you know, one, you had the situation with your husband and your son, plus dementia, plus cancer. That's a whole lot of stuff to deal with um, at one time. How did you cope? Again, I I don't know. I just, I never had to sit, I never sat down and thought, well, I can't do this any longer. I, and I never felt like that. I never it once. It was not an now, option. Yeah. It wasn't an option. You don't do that. You just get up and do it. I, I cried a lot. I cried an incredible amount. Buckets, uh, buckets, buckets full. But then that made me feel better. And, and once I cried, I would be fine. And I would get up and do it and just carry on. Um, there was never an option of saying, no, I can't do this and, and walk away from it. No, the, I wasn't brought up, to that, up like that. You stand by your man, you stand by your family. That's the way I was brought up. And I just dealt with it every day. I think I have quite a sunny nature, so I used to laugh at a lot, a lot of the things that would happen around the house. Um, yes, I think that's why coping mechanism laughing. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is, you know, either laughing or, or just allowing yourself to have a good old cry and then put on yes. your big girl panties and carry on, right? Um, <laughs> so that's the best way of, of, of doing it. And and now with, with COVID, you know, why I thought your book is so apt right now is with COVID-19, a lot of people have been thrown many curveballs, many of them unintended consequences, Um of this virus and people are struggling to cope. People are struggling with grief. People are struggling with the loss of business. People are struggling with the loss of freedom. There's so many issues that people are, are having to deal with. And I think your book is an excellent example of someone who's been thrown not one, not two, not three, but many curveballs um, throughout your lifetime. And you have found a way to very eloquently deal with those one at a time. Um, and, you know, having the spirit of never giving up, you know, just sort of feeling that giving up is not an option. And I think a lot of people could learn. We can all learn a lot of lessons from your book. And so I'd like to encourage people to go out and, and buy the book. Have you got a copy of the book there with you? I have, Bridgette. It looks a bit different than the cover you showed. Um, we played around with the, with the cover because the cover you see here is is a is a picture of of a tree that my son Andrew Paul. I'm going to show you the picture in the book. Right. Uh, on page seventy one, I think it is. Sorry. He drew this when he was six years old. In wow, when he was just six. That's amazing. And it's a big picture. It's about um, half of a me No, it's, yeah, it's on the A3. And it's on the A3 uh, paper. So it's quite a large yeah. picture. But the, yeah. I have a nephew who is a an artist, a really f formidable artist. And he said this picture is just so beautiful because it's so simple and it's so innocent and it, he said you can never draw like that as an as an adult he said you can never get the innocence back and we it's thought a this gorgeous was picture. Hey, isn't it and so we thought we'd use it on the front cover and that's why the cover is different than the one you saw um yeah we wanted to bring that in i i could have i should have said more about andrew paul and his his artistic nature is very artistic my mother-in-law is an artist my nephew is a very good artist my sister's the artist so my my sons are also very artistic but andrew paul because of his condition he has no motivation to to paint or to draw anymore so i can't get him to draw and make pretty pictures anymore <laughs> unfortunately you know that's the one thing that people um often miss about those who are differently abled. It doesn't mean because people have some sort of a disability, whether it's seen or unseen, that they can't do stuff. They do stuff differently. And whatever it is they do differently, they do it very, very well. 
Um, and so, you know, I mean, just the fact that your son is so amazingly artistic is wonderful, wonderful. And I'm glad that you were able to incorporate um, some of his artwork in your book. I think that's a lovely tribute to who he is as a person. Yes, thank you, Brigitte. I, I felt I wanted to show something about him. I didn't put any photographs in the book. I didn't think that was necessary. But um, Andrew Paul is, yes, he's a gentle soul, actually. He's, he's very sensitive and he's, he's autistic. And he just has this horrible disease that he can't be what he needs to be. And that, I think, was the, the greatest tragedy for me over the years. Um, and it makes me emotional every time I think about it. Is that he can't be normal like us and have a career and a wife and a family. You know, he's told me often, Mom, I'm lonely. You know, what do I do? Um, one day I said to him, but go out and find yourself a girlfriend. And he said to me, I don't have a job. I don't have a car. I don't have money. How can I have a girlfriend? You know what I mean? And it's so sad. And it's like but, but you know, Anna Marie, if, if you take a step back and you listen to his words, it means he has given a lot of thought to that. He realizes that to have a girlfriend is a responsibility, that he needs money. Uh, and I think as a mom, that should make you proud. Oh, the yes, I'm incredibly proud. That's a deep thinker. No, he certainly realizes that. He thinks about that often. Um, and in the past, he had girlfriends and everything, but because of the illness, it just doesn't last because they don't have the kind of need for for relationships like we have. Um, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, 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 schizophrenic is not antisocial. They, they, they're not awkward around people. They like people. They can talk to people. But they are they asocial. They love people yeah. often. Yeah. Yes. They are asocial. You are there as a means to an end. So in other words, he knows I'm his provider for whatever he needs, cigarettes, pocket money, whatever, he, uh, clothes, whenever he needs it, he can just give me a call. But relationships in that sense is not really so important for them. He has, he said, he said friends, I mean, and he lives in a home and there are other people there who are like him because they're, they're a home full of schizophrenics and people who are bipolar. But he would have, he, he'll tell me, okay, mom, I've got a girlfriend. And I said, well, that's fantastic. And then he would, go for a few weeks and I'll see, I said to him, well, how's your girlfriend? And he'll say, oh, no, she's not my girlfriend anymore. That relationship wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> Which is quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he realizes that, but yet it doesn't really matter to him then. He thinks, oh, well, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay, yeah. didn't that? So it's fine. But also, of course, the, the medication he takes keeps him on an even kill and I think a lot of those a lot of the medication is to to suppress sexuality I think so it must do because otherwise they'll be all running around like rabbits in that place I promise you and they don't they don't they all calm and of course sedated most of the time but they look normal but they don't have kind they don't have physical relationships in that in that um, home. And I don't think it's because somebody tells them don't, then they mustn't. I don't think the medication allows for it. Um, it suppresses it, which is a good yeah. thing in one sense. Anna-Marie, can you let us know where people can find your book? Where, how can they buy a copy of your book? Do you want to hold it up and then just let people know where they can buy one? It is still at the printer as we speak. This is my dummy, my proof. But I have loaded it on Amazon. It's on Kindle Books. You can you can order a copy there. And once I've done the printing, I will let uh, my, my publicist will put it into bookshops and otherwise they can actually just contact me personally and I can send them a copy as well. Awesome. awesome. Anna Marie, thank you so much. Um, congratulations on getting your book out. 
and hopefully the, the, the hard copies will be available soon. Thank you so much yes. for sharing your journey and sharing your story with us. Really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank you, Bridget. It was fantastic. I was quite nervous at the beginning, but yes, it was great. And I really appreciate that. And wonderful. Thank you again. <laughs> A big pleasure. Thank you to all our viewers who are um, watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Periscope, on Twitter, and also on Twitch. We really appreciate you sharing this. Have a great day, everyone. And don't forget to write good stuff. We'll see you back again next week, same time, same place. So from me in Cape Town, South Africa, it's goodbye for now and stay well. Mm -hmm.